than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, than a wicked and Intermediate sequel. Uh, I think on the, the course website the schedule said advanced sequel, but uh, I've, I've uh, toned it down a little, so it's, it's just right in the middle where we want it to be. Um, a few just administrative things before we get started. Uh, so the late policy, um, what was on uh, the course website uh, didn't match what I said in, in the first lecture, so um, this is the new official late policy and, and the um, course website should be updated now to reflect this. So uh, you have a total of four late days for projects only. So not for homeworks, homeworks get no late days. You have four late days for projects only where you, you, have, you have no penalty extension. So uh, for example, I, I, this is just again reiterating things I said in the, um, the previous lecture, but uh, you could for example, turn in one project four days late, or you could turn in four projects each one day late, and you won't be penalized on uh, it. Again, the late days are rounded up to the nearest uh, integer, so if you're four hours late, then it's going to count as one full day late. Um, and it, it, again, if you hand in any, any homeworks late, or uh, you've used up all of your extension days for the projects, you'll lose 25% of the assignment grade per day. And then after four days, it'll, it'll be a, a zero. Um, you can allocate the late days however you wish. I think just uh, it, it, the instructions sh should say that you just have to, to uh, specify uh, that you're using a late day on the, the project submission. Uh, for office hours, um, again, last time I, I told you we, we didn't have full clarity yet. Uh, we, we've um, added the TA office hours to the website. Um, some of them will be in person and some of them will be remote on Zoom. So whatever uh, you feel most comfortable with, feel free to, to um, choose between those two options uh, as you see fit. Um, for the in-person -per office hours, we're still uh, uh, trying to figure out the, the exact physical locations where those will be. Uh, so we're working to schedule those, but we're going to finalize uh, all office hours, everything will be finalized on the website by uh, the end of this week. And again, the plan is to have uh, most or all of the days of the week covered um, with, with uh, uh, more availability on uh, the, the few days leading up to a, a big project deadline. Uh, the, the one last thing I want to mention, uh, some of you um, I think have asked about uh, uh, slides being available uh, before uh, the lecture, uh, so you can you know annotate them or take notes directly on them, whatever. Um, I will try to uh, starting next next week. I, I haven't done it for today, but starting next week Monday, um, I'll, I'll start posting them uh, ahead of the lecture, so you can download them and, and reference them or write on them. Um, okay, so that's all the administrative stuff. Uh, are there any questions about anything there? No. Okay. So now let's move on to uh, the fun stuff content. So relational languages. Uh, last time, kind of we we talked about the relational model and relational algebra, um, and the the key idea was that we wanted to avoid having to tell uh, the database management system DBMS um, exactly how to execute a query. We wanted to say, okay, you have to follow these steps. Uh, to execute, execute a query, rather what we wanted to do was provide a, a high-level declarative specification for the query uh, so that the uh, DBMS would be able to, to figure out how to do it for us. Uh, so essentially saying what it is that you want, the, the answer is that you want, rather than how to get that answer. Um, so uh, just as an example, imagine you wanted some output that was sorted um, you don't necessarily want to have to tell the DBMS, okay, go do a merge sort or go do a, a quick sort or whatever kind of algorithm. You just want to say, hey, get me some the, the, the data sorted and let it figure out how, how best to do that for you. Uh, so the, the main advantage here is, is again, you don't have to get um, 
bogged down in more little details, but also uh, the, the DBMS can can um, perform different operations or different use different algorithms depending on uh, your your data that you have. So uh, if your data changes, you don't have to like rewrite your application. For example, in the, the Python code that we saw, um, the CSV example, if you wanted to use a different algorithm, you'd have to, to go and modify that um, in the application level code. So you don't need to do, do that anymore. The DBMS can kind of take care of all that behind the scenes for you. And um, the, the, the way that the DBMS is going to uh, sort of figure this out is through a, a, a pretty sophisticated process called query optimization. So there's a, a, a piece, a specific component of uh, the DBMS software stack called the query optimizer um, that's going to take a query that you write uh, and then figure out essentially the best way to execute it. And um, it, it's, a, it's a really uh, a detailed process, there are a lot of al algorithms, and uh, it's, it's basically a search process where you're searching for whole different equivalent ways um, of executing the plan to find the most efficient one. And I think we're going to talk about that um, in a few weeks, so actually in a few weeks um, after the midterm probably. Um, so again, this is one of the, the most difficult um, and time-consuming parts of building a DBMS. Uh, and this is where a lot of the engineering effort goes um, in the, the development process. So uh, today is, is going to be about SQL. Um, this is just a little bit of history. I've, uh, to, to, to give a little background, uh, SQL isn't, isn't a new language. It goes all the way back to the 1970s. Um, remember, Ted Codd released uh, a paper about the, the relational model, and he was a, a mathematician and, and not really a programmer, so he was going to implement the system. It was just kind of a high-level uh, theoretical way of thinking about um, the problem of, of database management. So um, the, the uh, IBM uh, group at, in San Jose decided that they were going to try to build a, a prototype DBMS based on Cod's ideas. Um, and, and the system that, that they ended up with, uh, it's one of the first relational database management systems, was called uh, System R. So specifically for the, the um, query language piece, which is how you interact with um, uh, the database, so you query the data, uh, these two guys, Chamberlain and Boyce, um, came up with a, a query language for it. And the first one was called Square, which uh, is specifying queries as relational expressions. Uh, I don't know if it was very catchy uh, since it, it didn't go anywhere. Um, but their, their second uh, attempt at that was uh, called Structured English Query Language. It was spelled out SQL, and that's kind of where um, we get, we get the, the SQL pronunciation from. So that, that was uh, um, developed in 1974 for IBM's uh, System R prototype. Uh, so again, um, some people say SQL, some people spell it SQL. Um, kind of the, the, the reason that came about was uh, because the uh, um, IBM team got uh, sued. Uh, there was already some other language or something out there um, spelled out SQL, so they kind of abbreviated it to just SQL. Structured query language. So um, again, either pronunciation is fine. Uh, I primarily say SQL, but uh, like I said, I'll, I'll know what you're talking about if you say it the other way. Um, so System R was never released. It was just a research prototype. They wrote a bunch of papers about it. Um, they got published, but uh, there was never like a publicly available release. And um, what ended up happening was IBM released a, a series of databases, a commercial database management systems um, over the next few years and, and probably the, the most, the, the longest lasting and most impactful one was uh, IBM DB2. Um, so the uh, uh, kind of SQL uh, ANSI standard was uh, released in 1986 and ISO in 1987 and again it's it's uh, abbreviated or abbreviation or a, a acronym for structured query language. And uh, this is kind of where, where it started and uh, has gone through the, the specification process today. Like I said, um, 
there are sort of these re-releases updates of the SQL standard. It's, it's not a dead language. Uh, it's been progressing to see these major releases um, kind of every few years, even though it's it's 40 years old, over 40 years old by now. Um, and they, they, the, the people who are in charge of um, kind of releasing the standard, uh, you can kind of see as, as certain uh, uh, technology trends went in and out of favor. Um, they got added to the SQL standard, and I don't know, it's, it's uh, unbelievably huge now um, to, to go through compared to, to where it started in, in the 80s. But um, all of these things, like most recently, uh, JSON, which is, is popular now in uh, web programming, web development, um, that got added recently to the standard in, in 2016. But the core structure of the language has not changed. It's been pretty much the same since uh, the initial uh, specification in the 80s. Um, but there is one catch, which is that uh, none of major database management systems, the, the commercial ones, the open source ones, um, none of them really follow the standard. So it's called the standard, but uh, people diverge pretty heavily. So the, the core piece that uh, you need, the, the minimum language syntax that you need to be able to support to say that your um, DBMS uh, support SQL is SQL 92 standard. But, but beyond that, um, there are a lot of uh, um, kind of small details or ways that different developers have implemented things differently. And we'll see some examples in the lecture today and it can get kind of confusing. Uh, I mean, you, you think that you know, SQL is SQL, um, but it turns out there are a lot of tricks or caveats that, that uh, you have to, to watch out for in practice. Okay, so um, at a high level, SQL is broken down into three um, main parts. The data manipulation language, um, the data definition language, and the data control language. So the, the data manipulation language uh, is responsible for um, retrieving and modifying data. So if you want to query uh, a database or update some, some values in the database, uh, you're working with uh, DML commands. Um, the, the data definition language is how you specify objects in the database. So for example, uh, if you recall the, the music store um, example, you have the artist table and the albums table. If you want to specify those tables in the database, uh, you're going to use um, uh, DDL commands to create the table. And, and uh, it goes beyond just table definitions. Um, you can create all sorts of things, indexes, uh, triggers, and they're all any um, uh, data, database component, any database object you, you can create is specified with uh, DDL. Finally, the data control language is used um, for security access control, uh, specifying which users can, can view or update um, which, which parts of the database. So it's a way of limiting uh, access to, to certain uh, database objects. Okay, so there's also all these other features. You can define views, you can materialize results. Um, integrity and referential constraints are something uh, uh, that is important we'll talk about later in the course, and particularly transactions. So if you have multiple um, concurrent programs or applications that are accessing uh, a database at the same time, as I said, you want the, the DBMS, uh, as I said last class, you want the DBMS to kind of um, manage those concurrent operations to make sure that um, you don't have lost rights or lost updates or uh, everything sort of stays consistent. So transactions are an important um, uh, topic we're going to talk about um, later in the course. And I think I alluded to this last time, but uh, there's an important difference between uh, SQL and kind of the, the relational model that we've talked about. And that is that SQL is based on um, bag algebra or multisets. So that means you can have duplicates in your data set, um, whereas a, a set obviously means there are no duplicates. So if you think about kind of the, the three sort of data structure options you have, you have lists, um, which uh, allow you to have duplicates, but there's a defined order to the list. So you can, you know, append things at the end, or you can find the end element in a list. Uh, sets mean you can't have duplicates, um, but there's no order. They're completely unordered, um, so there's no relationship between uh, 
the relative position of uh, objects in the set. And bags have uh, can have duplicates, but uh, they're like sets, they're unordered. So importantly, um, just keep in the back of your mind that, that SQL is based on this bag algebra or multi-set algebra rather than um, sets. So um, today's kind of uh, agenda for, for covering the different parts of SQL. Um, we're going to walk through each of these different things. So aggregations and group buys, uh, certain operations for manipulating strings, dates, and other, other uh, time-based operations, um, output control or redirecting where you want query results to go, uh, nested queries, which means you can have uh, arbitrarily nested queries, Common table expressions, um, which I think are going to be important for the, uh, some of the homework questions, um, and window functions, which are, are also in the homework. Oh, sorry, the other thing I, I forgot to mention in the beginning of class, uh, the first homework assignment was released. Uh, it should be, should be on the website now. Um, it's a, a SQL assignment. You take a look. Uh, based on today's lecture, you should be able to answer um, all of the, the questions in the assignment. Okay, so um, the, the example database that we're going to work with for today's, uh, all, all the examples in today's lecture is sort of this uh, student course database. So you have the student table, which has a student ID, it's just a, a random number, um, the name of the student, the, the login that they use to, to get into the um, computer network, age and GPA, and the courses are just uh, uh, different um, courses with the ID and the name of the course. Uh, they're all data related because it's all, all we care about. Um, and then the enrolled, uh, uh, the enrolled table um, is going to map students to particular enrollments in those courses. So you'll see that they, in the enrolled table, there's a student ID, the course ID for the course that they're enrolled in, and uh, the grade that the student received for that course. So um, before we move into the uh, more advanced stuff, I just want to go over the basic syntax. And uh, today I am going to show a, a live demo of this. Uh, just a free life advice. Uh, the first rule of public speaking is never uh, do a live demo, especially if you're in charge of like a multi-billion dollar company. But uh, I think this is just intro to databases, so it should be fine. So let me switch over to the demo. Okay, looks good. And I'm going to type on this uh, computer because this surface isn't very good to type on. So um, I have I have three three. Uh, DBMS instances running on the machine. One is uh, uh, Postgres or PostgreSQL. Um, another is MySQL, and the third is SQLite, which I mentioned last time. SQLite is the one uh, it's probably the most deployed DBMS in the world. It's on phones, web browsers, um, operating systems all over the place. Uh, so, just to show you that this works. I hope it works. Uh, but we should be able to see that I paste that up. Okay, good. So this query is just very simple. It's just going to get um, all of the uh, uh, records, tuples from the student table. Um, you can see it there. We get them all back. Let's try the course one. Okay, there are all the courses. And finally, the enroll table. Great. Okay. Everything's working, so we can switch back to this now. There we go. Great, okay. So, the basic syntax, uh, as we saw kind of a, a preview of last class, 
Um, the basic syntax is to have these, these three uh, pieces of the SQL query. So the select statement is where you list the columns that uh, you're interested in seeing, the columns or attributes. Um, the from statement is where you specify the tables that you want uh, uh, records to come from. And the where statement is where you specify uh, the, the selection or filtering predicates that you want to apply. So just as a, as a again, a really simple example, uh, if you want to get the names and GPAs uh, for all the students who are older than um, 25 years old, uh, we would write it out as select name, comma, GPA. So that gets you those two columns from the student table where uh, age is greater than 25. So that's your selection predicate. And again, if you think back to the um, uh, relation algebra that we saw, um, the first statement, the select, is equivalent to uh, uh, the projection. So you're projecting on name and GPA. And the bottom statement, uh, where, is equivalent to uh, the, the selection operator, where your age is greater than 25. And again, uh, I didn't come up with the names, but, but the select statement in SQL maps to the projection operator in relational uh, algebra, and the where statement in SQL maps to the selection operator in relational algebra. And if we... Uh, I wish there's a way, I think, if I swap out of this, it's going to uh, have trouble getting back to my slides, but we'll figure it out. Um, okay, so again, this, this query just, just seen executed by Postgres, we paste it in there, um, select name, GPA for a student, where age is greater than 25, we'll get an answer. Uh, everyone is greater than 25. Cool. Okay, so. Nice, all right. Okay, so, um, great. So I think, in my opinion, the most um, uh, conceptually difficult thing, and it seems, it seems simple to a lot of people who, who work database a lot or um, have studied them before, but the, the most conceptually difficult thing to me uh, to understand it as a new student is um, joins. So if you remember the relational algebra, algebra operator, you have the join uh, from last class, and we can use that to combine uh, tuples from two tables or relations that match on some uh, particular key. So just as an example, uh, here, if we want to get uh, all of the students that got an A in this 15721 course, uh, so, just looking at the query, we have the same select statement, uh, and what I've done in the from statement is I've listed both the enrolled table and the student table, and uh, I, I just gave them a little nickname, or it's called an alias, um, just to make typing easier. So, the enrolled table is aliased as E, and the student table is aliased as S, and again, the, the the where clause is, is similar, so we want all of the students where their e.grade is an A, and uh, the course ID is 15721, and, and this is the, the new piece I've added to do the join, the um, e.s ID, so that's the student ID part of the enrollment record, um, matches the student s.s ID. So, what this is going to do is going to join the student table to the enrollment table, filter by only the students that got an A and only the students in that class, and then return the names of those students. So does, this, does anyone have any questions about joins? Since I know it's, uh, it's kind of a, a difficult kind of, if you've seen it before, maybe it, it, it uh, makes sense, but um, I remember when, when I was learning this stuff, I think this was where 99% of the confusion came from. So there, there are many more examples. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, how did this just realize, oh, well, I asked 
because it's students who uh, like basically just classify as, as, as students, so we just like work, I guess. Yeah, so the, the way that the query um, is parsed by the system is it starts with the, the from clause piece. So it'll look at the tables that you are want to access. And since it starts with that piece, it, it applies the alias up front. So then when it looks at the other parts of the query, the where clause and the select clause, it knows the, um, what, what the alias is. Yes? What happens if you don't have the and e.sid equals s.sid? That's a good question. Um, do you mind repeating it for the moment? Sure. If, if uh, you do not include the and e.sid equals s.sid, what will happen? So, well, we can actually try it. Uh, I have the demo set up here. So let's hop over. So it's select s.name from enroll. It's uh, not case sensitive, but as e student as s where where e dot grade equals a and E dot CID equals fifteen seven twenty one and oh sorry I don't know what happens without that okay so what's going to happen is we're going to get all of the students back so why is that it's because it's going to go and look for any time that a student ever received an A and it's going to return the name of the student. So there's, if there's no filtering for uh, the enrollments, it's not going to be able to check to see if the student received an A in that course. So in this case, if there's ever a student that ever received an A in this um, uh, case, it's going to return uh, the name of the student. Make sense? Good. All right. So let's switch back here. Okay, so any other questions about joints? Great. Oh, sorry, good. So without the e.sid equals s.sid, is this essentially a partition class? Uh, the question was without the, uh, the, the join condition that matches the two IDs, does it produce a Cartesian product? Yes. So if, if there's no join condition, it's going to get, it's going to perform the filter, the two filters here, just on the enrollment table, and then it's going to match every student with, with the, the filtered enrollment uh, uh, tools. Yes? In that case, if there were multiple students who got A's in that course, would it, uh, would it you know, keep student's name multiple times? Or would it, like, hope, like, would it uh, be a uh, okay, so the question is, if uh, there were multiple students who got A's in the course, would it list each of the student names uh, multiple times? And the answer is yes. So uh, I, I, if, if we go back and look at the, the definition, I think there was only, or the, the data definition, the insert statements, there was only one student who got an A in the course. So if you join all of the student names with that one record from um, the enrollment table that had an A in it, you get three, three. But uh, yes, if, if there were multiple, it would repeat them uh, multiple times. Yes. Cool. Okay. So, aggregates. Um, aggregates are functions that return a uh, that they're going to return a single value from a bag of tuples. So uh, what you can think about is if, if, a, if a, you have a, a relation or a filtered relation, you can uh, aggregate across several tuples. So there are these different um, uh, predefined operators. Average returns the average value of a particular column. Min returns the min. Uh, max is the max. Sum returns uh, sum. You add up all the values in a column. Uh, and count obviously returns the number of um, 
tuples that are in the, the relation. Uh, some, there are some systems that let you define uh, custom aggregates. You can kind of make up your own. Uh, there are others that aren't listed here that some systems support, some don't. Um, but these, these are kind of the main important ones that probably get used uh, most. So um, the aggregate function can uh, almost only be used in the, the select output list. And by almost, I mean there are a few exceptions, but pretty much it's always going to show up in the select statement uh, of your query. So just as an example query here, let's say that you want to get the number of students with the, with the uh, a, a login as the substring at CSM. So uh, I'll explain what the, what the string matching is in a second, but um, basically, uh, if, if you recall what the, the input data looked like, everyone had that at CS um, you know, username, but imagine there were other students from, from other departments or something that had different uh, um, suffix for their username. So uh, the, the count function is going to go in the select clause, and we're going to say we want to count the number of logins, and we can alias it as, as a CMT in the um, output there, from the student table where the, the particular filter selection condition holds. So um, what we're doing here is applying where the login, the login name string is like, similar to, and we'll cover this in more detail in a few slides, but basically it's just performing a, a regular expression or a pattern match on uh, the end of the string. So the, the percent symbol, uh, and I, we're, we're used to you know other other wildcard operators like a star or something. But the percent symbol in SQL lets you search uh, for for pattern. So you specify where the login is like percent at CS. This is going to us all of the um, uh, the count of students with an at CS login. Now this is one way to write it. There are a few others. Uh, for example, you could just say count star. So star, um, as, I, as I showed in the beginning, is, a, is like a, um, uh, gives you all of the uh, columns for a particular table. So we don't really care um, about necessarily the count of specifically the login column. We're just interested in the count of the number of student tuples or records that um, match the criteria that we, we specify in the where clause. So um, you're free to just say, you know, count star, just to be count star of the, the result. Uh, and there's a, a, another way, you just say, you know, count one. So count one, we're just putting kind of the value one in there. We're saying, you know, count up the number of records um, that this query returns. So for every time that we find a student, uh, that matches this filter condition, uh, we're just going to produce a one and then we're just going to count up the number of ones that we see to re return the final count. Um, so, kind of the, the question might be, does the uh, DBMS care what you do? And the answer is no. Um, the DBMS is going to be smart enough to figure out, uh, just during the optimization phase, that all of these things pretty much mean the same thing. Um, it, it, you don't you don't really need the login or the you know the star operator. You get all the columns in your output. All you care about is the count. So all it needs to go to do is go through the relation and count the number of tuples that your query produces. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, if uh, you're doing the, the pattern matching and you have the at symbol that you're looking for, if you didn't have the at symbol in the, the pattern, do you still need the percent? Um, you, you do still need it. So uh, the, the, if, if there were no percent symbol and you just had, for example, at CS, it's going to look for an exact match of the, the string, the characters at C and S. If you want to find any string that ends with at CS, then the, the percent symbol is just like a, a wild card operator that lets you search for an arbitrary pattern.
Okay, so um, we can also apply multiple aggregates in the select clause. We don't just have to do one. Uh, so this query, for example, is going to get us the average GPA for all of the students, as well as the count of the students, again, where the, the login is uh, like percent at CS. So if we run this, what we're going to get back is a, is a result that has the average GPA computed 3.8 and the count um, for the number of students that, that meet this uh, selection criteria. Uh, we can also throw this distinct keyword in there. So um, remember I said that uh, there's uh, SQL is a, a bag algebra, so you can end up with duplicates. So if you just want to know, for example, the number of distinct elements in any of these um, aggregations, so for example, count, get the number of unique students that have an at CS in their login. So you want to get the count of distinct logins. Now, this query maybe is a little nonsensical because uh, I would hope that everyone has a distinct login. Um, if you have duplicates, there's probably an issue somewhere. But um, you could imagine there was a different, maybe it's uh, the, the uh, first name of the student. There are duplicate names, you're going to get a count of all of the distinct first names. Um, so this distinct keyword will allow you to do that. So if we have this query here, um, it's essentially going to get us the average GPA of students enrolled in each course. So if we run this query, what's I, maybe it seems like it makes sense. We say select average of the student GPA. We provide the enrollment course ID because we want to know, you know, for each course, give us the um, average GPA. And then we do the join between the enrolled table and the student table. This seems like it's going to work, but um, this actually isn't. So uh, if we have this value in here, um, the reason is, uh, what, what does this mean? So we saw that the aggregates are going to return, a, aggregation functions are going to return a single aggregated value, in this case the average GPA, but it's going to return us this uh, a single value of, of 3.86. What does that mean? And it's going to, the, the, the course ID is undefined because we're trying to take all of these students from all these different courses, smush them together into one uh, GPA, and then which um, course ID that we pick from the, the list that we had. So if I show you um, what's going to happen here in an example, we'll run it in Postgres, and we're going to get this weird value. So it gives us 3.86. Um, the average, oh sorry, that's not what I wanted. This one here. Okay, so it's going to compute the average for us in the previous one, but as soon as I add this e.cid um, to the query, it's going to, going to throw an error here. It's going to say that the, the e.cid doesn't know what to do with that because it doesn't know how to perform um, the, the grouping for the aggregate that it's computing. And I think if we do this, I can switch between. This one, let's try in MySQL. We'll see if MySQL likes it. Nope, they get the same error, so they say that there's a, a value or a, a column specified in the select clause. It doesn't show up um, in the aggregation we're trying to do. And then SQLite is the last one. We'll see if this works. Okay, so SQLite doesn't have a problem. Um, it gives us 3.86, uh, which is what, uh, what we saw if we, we didn't include that other piece. But, it, it shows us uh, 15,445. So what does that mean? Um, I don't really know. Uh, so it, it's just picking a random uh, course ID to fill in there um, because it, it doesn't know uh, what the semantics are of the grouping for the aggregation. Yes? Uh, is it, so the, the question is, does, is the value 15445 from the first from the 
first line potentially in the Cartesian product. Yeah, you're right. Yes. So it is is the uh, value of 15, 445 potentially from the filtered set uh, that produces the Cartesian product. And the answer is uh, yes, it could be. Um, there's kind of it's it's un, the value is undefined. So uh, clearly, their implementation allows you to to do this, but the way that they uh, provide that, that second value um, is undefined. So it could be coming from from that. It could be um, if they're maybe building a hash table to do lookups or something. It could just be the first value in the hash table. There's no um, method to, to where the value comes from because it's it's not defined by the standard. Yes. Uh, will it all? The question is, will it always return the same course that you found it? I don't know. Probably, but yes. So, uh, what I would guess is happening here is that there's a deterministic way that it's executing it. So uh, maybe you know it it uh, has the values, the students, and the uh, the courses sorted or something, and it just goes through them um, in that order and it just returns always the same value. Uh, so there's no, I, I, if, if uh, maybe I loaded the data in a different order or if I had a different um, values, there's no guarantee to get back the same value uh, because it's, it's undefined. Uh, it's not a well-formed query. Let me switch back to clusters. Okay, so if we want to fix this, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have to introduce a new operator called the group by operator. And what the group by operator is going to do is it's going to project tuples into subsets. So we have the big, you know, multi-set, the relation that we have, and we're going to project tuples into individual subsets in order to calculate aggregates against each of the subsets. So um, like in the, the example where we wanted to get um, the uh, average student GPA per course, uh, what we're going to do is, again, include the course ID in the select part of the query uh, and then um, add it to the new group by clause that we have at the bottom. And kind of a visual example of this is here we have the, uh, um, the relation that's produced from the join. And what we're going to do is perform the grouping. So each of, each of these um, uh, shaded groups there is going to be uh, grouped by the, the course ID. So all the, the 15721s, 15826, and 15445 are going to be grouped separately before we compute the average. And you see now we get a correct um, query result where the averages, the computed averages, are grouped correctly by course. So the rule is that you have to remember for this is that non-aggregated uh, values in the select clause must always appear in the group by clause. So we ran into that problem where the, the course ID didn't appear in the, the um, group by clause. Here I've got another one. Um, this query again doesn't make a ton of sense because you know each student can only take each course once. So there's only going to be one enrollment, but um, just, just to make the point, if, if you have that, that column appearing in the select clause, it must also appear in the group by clause. So you could fix it by also putting the, the s.main um, down there in group by. Okay, so um, are there any questions about group by before we move on to the next one? Great. Okay, the having clause. Um, the having clause is going to filter results based on some kind of uh, aggregation and computation. So you can think of, think about it like a, sort of a, a where clause for a group by. So in this query that I have up here, again, we're getting the average GPA um, per course. And what we want to do is, if you look down here, filter it. Um, by, by the uh, uh, average GPA greater than 
So we want to get all of the courses that have an average uh, student GPA greater than three point five. Unfortunately, this is not going to work um, because at the time that the where clause is evaluated, the predicate is evaluated, we're not going to know yet what the average GPA is. So if you think about, you know, in the, the select clause as we're trying to compute the average, um, each time we need to decide if a tuple belongs in the output set. How do we know what the average GPA is until we're done kind of, you know, we've, we've done all the uh, uh, aggregations. We, we can't know during uh, uh, filtering time whether what, what the average GPA is going to be. So we need to wait until uh, the query is computed all the averages and then do a final filtering pass. And that's what the having clause allows us to do. And like I said, it's, it's basically a, um, a where clause for a group by. So in this case, we have this having clause down at the bottom, and it says, uh, you know, compute this query result, but then filter out only um, the, the two bolts that have uh, an average GPA greater than 3.9. Um, unfortunately, I think this syntax is not standard, so what you actually need to do, uh, it's not great. So, some, some DBMSs might let you run it, um, but we, what you actually need to do is duplicate that, that uh, um, uh, average statement that you have in the select clause, you need to duplicate it again down in the, the having clause. Uh, I don't know why, um, because as I said, it's, it's evaluated kind of as the last step of the query, so if you think about as it's parsing it, it should know uh, what the alias as average GPA is, but um, for whatever reason, that's that's how the standard is. So, kind of this having clause lets you perform a filter on um, aggregated values. So, just as an example here, uh, if you if you perform the first part of the query, uh, where you get the, the group buys uh, computed, you get all the averages, and then you filter it out, and you only return um, the one tuple that has uh, the, the correct average. Okay, so uh, string operations. Um, strings are usually simple, but unfortunately in SQL they are not. Um, all of these different systems implement strings slightly differently. So um, the, the SQL 92 standard says that strings are case sensitive uh, and that when you are um, uh, specifying a string, you should use single quotes. You look at kind of the list here, the one that, that stands out and is probably the most annoying, and I, I'm not sure if this is true in the newest versions, but at least for a while, uh, MySQL was uh, uh, case insensitive. So if you uh, spelled Kanye like that, um, even though it's a weird way to do it, uh, it would still match to all lowercase or all uppercase, which is case insensitive matching. Um, some systems allow you to use single quotes, some allow double quotes, but the standard, and this should probably work in, in all of them, except for the case insensitive matching um, in MySQL, uh, is that the, the string matching is case sensitive and that you um, are using only a, a single quote. So, I mentioned uh, uh, like operators, uh, which allow us to do pattern matching um, earlier, and there, there are two string matching operators that we care about. So the, the percent sign that I, I showed um, will match any substring, including empty substrings. Uh, so it'll give you zero or more uh, character match. The uh, underscore character will match any one character. So in these two examples here, um, if you want to get all of the, the course IDs that look uh, have the 15 dash prefix, that's how you do it. If you want to get um, the student logins that are, are like uh, percent, so any substring at C underscore will get you a, a single character match there. So it could be CS, CA, CB, whatever. Kind of the, the second piece um, to string operations in the, the standard um, are, are these different uh, string functions. So the, the problem here is that a lot of DBMSs have uh, their own uh, 
uh, unique dialects, which makes uh, switching between them or working with different ones kind of tricky. Um, but they can be used in, in either the output or predicates or anywhere in the query there. Uh, yes. Um, so last time you mentioned this idea of like a null uh, as a thing something to be is uh, if you have an empty string, is that the same as null or is that different and would a pen sign match it? Yes, so the question is, um, is an empty string the same as null? Um, I cannot speak about every data, database management system's implementation of it, um, but in, in the general sense, uh, and I think according to the standard, an empty string and null are different. So an empty string is just a string of length zero and the percent sign will match to it. Um, a null string is, um, or sorry, a, a string column that has a null value, it's, it's specified as null, the value is just undefined. We don't know what the value is. So it doesn't have a length, it doesn't have, we, we don't know what it is. So, uh, String concatenation. Um, again, seems like it should be pretty easy. Uh, I have three, three different syntaxes up here for three different databases or database management systems. Um, the SQL standard says that you use this kind of double bars um, operator to concatenate two or more strings, but you know, pretty much every system you look at is their own uh, special way of doing it. Um, I don't know how many support the, the SQL standard syntax. Uh, I can show you a few examples here. Uh, so in SQL, SQL 92, you know, we should have these double bars. So if, if your system supports SQL 92, then it should support the double bars. Let's try these three that I have and see if uh, they do. So we're on Postgres here. I'm going to paste in this query. Okay, so that's just going to uh, concatenate the two strings data and base together and we're going to call it string. Let's see if it works. Okay, so Postgres uh, has the double bar operator that is SQL 92 compliant. So if we switch to MySQL, let's see if they do this. Uh, they do, it doesn't show me an error, but um, it gives me the answer zero. I don't exactly know what that means, so it's saying that the concatenation of string data with the string base is a zero. Uh, it's a little weird. Um, I guess another option we saw on the list was this plus sign, so maybe we'll plus two. Okay, we get zero again. Um, I guess I, I, I don't really know what it's doing, I don't know what this means, but um, it. it uh, it thinks the result is zero. So let's try MySQL as this concat operator. Um, we'll see, okay, so concat works with MySQL. So MySQL's special unique syntax for um, string concatenation is this concat operator. And let's try the last one here, SQL white. Okay, so SQL white supports this, this double bar. Um, if we look back on this, uh, if we look back on this, we can see there that if we had um, Microsoft SQL Server, they actually have this plus sign. Um, and as I showed you, MySQL only knows what concat means. So again, this is one of those things uh, that's kind of tricky. You have to be careful about um, how you, uh, which, which specific dialect uh, you're using. So daytime operations is another whole uh, dumpster fire of um, unique dialects. Um, daytime date operations are obviously uh, used to you know, figure out uh, the, the current date, uh, differences between dates, how many days have passed, that sort of thing. Um, you can use, again, uh, you can use them both in the output and the predicates, uh, and the, the syntax uh, varies widely. So, just as a quick demo here, um, I want to show kind of the, the, how you get the number of days since the beginning of this year. Uh, again, it seems pretty simple, but as we will see in a second, it is not. So we're back in Postgres here. Uh, let's try out if we can get now. So select now gives us the current day. Uh, that works. 
Let's try now on my SQL that works, that is today. And let's try now on SQLite. Okay, SQLite doesn't know what the function that now means. So, and we'll try a different one. Select current timestamp. Doesn't know what select current timestamp means. Maybe our last option is just select timestamp, not a function, just a, a system value. Okay, it knows what the current timestamp is. So, kind of uh, Postgres and MySQL support the now syntax uh, if you're using SQLite, uh, which I think you are for the, the, the homework assignment um, to get the current timestamp. Um, you need to use this current timestamp uh, value. Okay, so back to the original question, which is how do we get the number of days um, since the beginning of the year? Well, let's figure out what is today. So that gives us one. We extract the day from the month. Uh, that's going to give us the value of one. And if we want to figure out the difference here between two dates in Postgres, we can do it like this. Is going to give us the difference between the date, today's date, and the beginning of the year, um, and it's 240 days. So that works fine here. If we switch over to MySQL and take a look, it's going to tell us 800 days. Um, I, I don't know how we get 800 days a year. Um, I think there is some kind of weird uh, uh, differencing that's going on in MySQL. Someone answered this online somewhere. Uh, I think the first digit is the difference in the month. So uh, the September 9 minus January 1 gives 8. And then the difference between the two days, you know, the first day of the month, 0, 1 minus 0, 1 gives 0. So I think that's how they're getting their 800. Um, I think we can maybe test it out, do a different day. Uh, let's do tomorrow. So this, if, if what, Whoever that guy online was said was true, then uh, we should get 801 there, right? I guess, well, okay, so I guess you can believe some things you read online. Um, okay, so this uh, clearly doesn't work to get us the number of days. Uh, so another way around this that I, I uh, figured out here is that we can get the, the Unix timestamp, so the number of seconds or uh, since the epic. Uh, 19, January 1st, 1970, or whatever it is. Um, get that for today's date, that for the date at the beginning of the year. Um, round it, and then multiply by 60 seconds times 60 minutes uh, times 24 hours a day. And hopefully, that's going to give us great 243 days as we expect. Um, MySQL actually also has this. Uh, Date diff function, which makes it a little easier, and that also gives 243. So SQLite, uh, which is again, I think, what's being used for the homework. Um, let's try this out, see if it works. Okay, it thinks that there's zero days between uh, today and the beginning of the year, which is obviously not true. So uh, for SQLite, what you're going to have to do is use this uh, Julian day function. Uh, so you convert the current timestamp, remember we don't have now, I uh, have to convert the current timestamp uh, to the, the day in the Julian calendar and then uh, subtract it from the, the day for the um, day of the year. And that's going to give us 243 days and hopefully if we round it, we will get 243 days. Nice, okay, great. So. Um, kind of, you would think something as simple and as frequent, I mean, I think in a lot of applications, state manipulation is, is something that comes up a lot. Uh, you would think that this should be pretty standardized, but as hopefully this has demonstrated, um, all of these systems are all over the place in, in their uh, implementations of them. Okay, so any questions about uh, the, the date and time stuff, since I think there are a few homework questions about that. Oh, okay. 
All right, so uh, I think we're running a little behind here, so I'll try and speed it up a little bit. But I'll, I'll stick around uh, after if, if people have particular questions uh, or need things clarified. Um, so output redirection basically allows you to store query results in another table. So uh, essentially what you're doing is you're using this into keyword, which says select all of the uh, distinct CIDs uh, from enrolled, and we're going to put them in the, the course IDs table. So it's going to perform the query, select distinct CID from my role enrolled, and stick them all in a um, new table we define course IDs. MySQL has this kind of weird syntax, which you can create table course IDs uh, based on this query. Um, and I think there are some other uh, uh, different um, syntaxes that are out there that different systems support, um, but but these, uh, the, the, the first one is, is what the standard specifies. So uh, the, the, there's also the, the ability to, rather than create a table, you can just bulk insert basically a, a bunch of uh, tuples from a query into another table. Um, and the, the inner select clause has to generate uh, the same column, so the schema of the query needs to match the schema of the table you're trying to insert into. And uh, different DBMSs have different ways of, of um, handling different integrity violations. So imagine, for example, you specified that you wanted uh, your um, student ID or student logins to be unique, and you tried to insert um, a bunch of tuples with duplicate values. Uh, into the table, then different DBMSs would handle that differently. So some will throw an error on the first duplicate they find, um, and they'll you know, roll back and remove all of the, the tuples that they previously inserted. Some will throw an error but keep every, all the work that they've done up to that point, uh, so you can you know, stop halfway through. And some uh, are just going to ignore the error and keep going, they'll give you, you know, a warning or something at the end that says, hey, there was this, uh, this number of uh, violations, but um, you know, we inserted all the, the records that we could. Um, a, a sort of a, a different, uh, uh, this is output redirections. This is saying where you want the query result to go. It doesn't have to go to the terminal. It can go to another object in the database. Um, output control uh, allows you to essentially format uh, or reorganize the output. So uh, this order by, order by um, statement allows you to perform sorting. Remember uh, that we talked about uh, SQL is an unordered uh, multi-set or bag, so there's no, you know, there's no order or relationship um, between the, the uh, tuples in relation, um, but you can Im impose an order uh, in a query based on some um, column. So in this case, uh, we're, we're selecting these uh, student IDs and their grades, um, and we're sorting it or ordering it by grade. So uh, by default, I think that is, it's going to produce it in a, a um, ascending order. So these are lexicographically sorted. So all the A's first and then um, other grades. So you can make this a little simpler. You can also say order by one. And uh, what that's going to do is it's going to order by the um, uh, first column, so they'll, they'll sort it by the student ID. Um, if you instead wanted to, for example, order by grades descending, so in, in reverse order, uh, you specify this descending keyword, so order by grade descending, and you can again have a, a comma-separated list like you have any of the other operators, where now we're sorting by first by um, the, the grade descending, and then by the student ID ascending. So, That'll end up end up here with first it'll do the grades, figure out that sort of order, and then uh, if there are if there are um, ambiguities based on the grade, it'll sort by the, the student ID. And again, you can mix and match these things here. You can sort by the grade descending, and then you can use one um, to specify the, the positional offset of the um, column in the sort of in the select clause. Okay, so there's the order by, which gives you uh, the, the sort order for your output. The, the limit clause 
um, is going to restrict the output to uh, the number that you specify. So for example, in this case, if we say um, limit 10, it's only going to give us 10 uh, results from this query. So it's like you see uh, you know, on a web page where you're paginating results. This is one way of doing it. Um, you specify, you know, I only want the first 10. And then if you want to get maybe the next 10, uh, you can specify, okay, give me uh, limit 20, but starting from offset 10. So in this way, you can kind of control um, both the, the number of tuples that you're getting back, as well as uh, the starting position in, in the result. And um, kind of the, the tricky thing you have to remember here is that because there's no order, um, this, isn't, this isn't necessarily well defined. There's no guarantee that you'll get a disjoint subset for these um, two queries. What you need is if you had an order, order by clause, uh, then you, you could guarantee um, disjoint. Okay. So the next piece, um, it's a little tricky, is nested queries. Uh, they're often really difficult, remember I talked about this query optimizer, they're often really difficult for the query optimizer to optimize, usually it tries to rewrite it to something that's a little better at. Um, and inner queries can appear almost anywhere inside a query. So think of this like a function that returns a result to the outer query and then the outer query um, works on it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you an example here. So imagine we have um, this inner query. It's here in the, the parentheses down the bottom. Select this ID from the role. That's going to get us all of the student IDs. So think about it like the result. All of the student IDs from the enrolled table. The outer query is going to then uh, get us all of the names from student where it finds an SID in. So it, it appears somewhere in that inner query result that we've computed. So the way this executes is first, we compute the result of the inner query, the nested query, and then the outer query uh, can reference the results that are produced there. So again, let's get the names of uh, the students in 15.445. So if we want to uh, uh, do this in, in a nested query, format, what we want to do is figure out, okay, select the student IDs from enrolled where the course ID is 15445. And the way that we're going to, to figure that out is by saying, okay, where uh, the student ID is in this result set that is produced by the um, uh, missed query. So these two SIDs, SID here, in the, the nested query is going to show up uh, from the SID from the enrolled table, whereas SID in the outer query, because of the query scope, is going to refer to the student table. So kind of, uh, we saw that example with, with uh, joining. This is essentially uh, uh, performing a join between student and enrolled, just rewritten in a little bit uh, different way. So the different types of operators that we have for the nested queries um, are these four. So all means that uh, you must satisfy the expression for all rows in the subquery. So the subquery produces a result. Whatever your outer query is, that result has to satisfy all of uh, the rows in the subquery. The any operator means you have to satisfy at least one row in the subquery. So there has to be at least one row um, that shows up. Uh, the, the in is equivalent to any and exists um, is similar as at least one row, row is returned. So there has to be at least one row uh, that exists. So just a, as, a, as a quick example, if we want to get all of the students in 15.445, uh, we issue this query that says uh, get me all the student names where SID equals any and then from this uh, subset that we've generated of all of the student IDs from the enrolled table. Okay, so um, let me. I'm going to try and we only have a few minutes left here, so I want to get to the next pieces. Uh, make sure that you can do the homework. And again, I, I will stick around a little 
happy to answer any questions. Um, so uh, this this not exists. Uh, I mentioned the exists query. So where there uh, you want to select star from course where um, at least one tuple exists in the output set that gets generated by using the not operator to invert it. So you're saying where um, something does not exist. So this find all courses that have no students enrolled in it. So you're saying essentially we don't we don't want there to be any tuples. There should be no tuples that exist um, in the, the subquery that we're providing here. So for example, if we do select star from enrolled, where course ID uh, equals the enrolled ID is going to produce um, nothing, and then uh, uh, or sorry, it's going to produce the advanced topics and database course. And there are going to be no students that exist or are enrolled in that course. So this course ID here refers to the course ID in the, the outer query. Okay. Um, I, like I said, this the, the I want to get to these these last two topics because they're important for the So window functions. Um, window functions uh, essentially perform a sliding calculation across a set of related tuples. So you might think, okay, this sounds kind of like a group by aggregation, um, but they, they're, in this case, they're not being grouped into a single aggregate value. So this is useful, for example, if you want to do something um, like you're analyzing time series or something, you compute maybe the moving average or sliding average or sliding window over um, some data like that. So the, the syntax for this um, is that we're going to apply the function name select function name over uh, some partition from the table. So you can think of the over piece like a group by. And I'll, I'll explain what this means in a second. So the aggregation functions uh, appear there, and the over functions is how to slice up the data um, for your uh, partitioning. So uh, the, the aggregation functions, what can this be? Anything we discussed earlier, so you know, average, min, max, count, all that stuff. Um, the window functions, the special specific window functions that we have are row number, so that's going to give us the number, position of the current row, and the rank, so that's going to give us the order position of the current row. So the row number is the total overall number of the result, uh, and the rank is the position within a partition. So uh, if you recall, like I said, the, the um, SQL semantics have no uh, uh, sort order on them, so there's uh, really no way to enforce this without um, kind of these window function operations. So these uh, enforce some, some kind of order on the, the uh, tuples in your result. So just as an example here, um, this is going to give us the row number uh, over no partition, so that's empty, so you're just going to give us the row number over the whole relation and if you look at the, the results there, uh, they're enumerated in order, uh, the, the row number there. So that's what that row number function produces. So like I said, the over keyword uh, specifies how to group the tuples together, and the uh, partition by keyword um, gives you the, the group that you were uh, calculating. So in this example, we want to get the row number over, and now we specify the partitions. We want to partition by the, the CIID or the course ID. So what it's going to give us is the students, the row number of each student partitioned by course ID. So if we look at it, you know, we get these three different uh, course IDs, and we can see kind of the, the uh, student row numbers are only, the scope is only per course ID. So the first partition is for 15,445. Um, row numbers one and two, second partition, and the, the third partition, the counts, the row numbers reset for each one. Uh, you can also specify uh, uh, order by, and like I said, this gives us the ordering, so then we'd be able to uh, get a, a distinct order. So in this case, we want to, we want to order by um, CID uh, for the partitioning. So, just as, as a quick example here, we're going to find the student with the second highest grade for each course. So we have to combine a couple things. Uh, we want to get uh, the rank, which is the local partition, uh, local position in the partition um, for each, each record. We're going to partition by the course ID, 
We want to order by uh, the grade ascending. So what this is going to do is going to sort um, that each partition by the student grade ascending, and we're going to take the second one, so it's ranking dot rank equals two. I know I'm covering this really fast, and I apologize, but I, I really need to get to the, the last part here for uh, um, the homework. But again, if anyone has any questions, just please uh, stop me home. I'll uh, try to answer them as quickly as I can. So, um, okay, this is the last piece, uh, and also these are really cool. Um, so, common table expressions essentially uh, provide a way to um, write like auxiliary statements uh, for use in a larger query. So, imagine it's like it's going to create a temporary table that you um, can reference later in a query. So it's, it's sort of like a, an alternative or a different way of specifying nested queries um, and views. So uh, the, the syntax here is like this. So with, CT, with CTE name, specify as just an alias that you want to call it, as, and then you uh, uh, specify a query that you want to uh, define as the, the common table expression. So in this case, it's just uh, uh, specifying select one. So it looks kind of like a nested query, but what this is doing is it's essentially like basically you can think about it as computing a result set up front that you can reference later in your query. So you you um, have a handle to the CTE name that you can then reference select star from CTE name. So I'll, I'll try to show some concrete examples here. You see the, the uh, name that is referenced gets used later in the query. Uh, so um, you, you, you combine individual columns using uh, uh, this, this notation here where you want to reference you know, CT name column one, you can rename them um, however you like and then use them in, in later columns, so or later in the query. So in this example, like in the, the, the bottom query there, you end up adding column one and two together, you get three, um, based on the, the rows returned from the CT. So, the, the, okay. so just as a concrete example of this, um, you want to find a student record with the highest ID that's enrolled in at least one course. So with uh, the, the uh, CT source is defined as the, the uh, name of the CTE, you have the max ID, and that query is just all it's doing is selecting uh, the max student ID from enrolled. Then, in your uh, a later query, what you're going to do is say select the name from the student and CTE source where, so this is performing essentially a join on uh, the student SID and the CTE source max ID that you calculated in uh, the common table expression you computed. So again, this CTE source is referring to um, the value that, that you uh, specified up there. Uh, so, I think this is, this is going to be the last thing here, just uh, a recursion, uh, really cool. Uh, Andy said that I have to show you a demo, so I have to show you demos. Um, I'm actually obligated. Okay, so uh, CTEs allow you to essentially implement recursion in SQL queries. So th uh, the flexibility it gives you is allows you to kind of compute an arbitrary uh, uh, a recursive function for uh, a loop. So, for example, imagine you wanted to write just a for loop in Python uh, to go through and count uh, all the numbers from, from 1 to 10, uh, or print out the numbers from 1 to 10. This is how it would look in um, uh, the, the, using the CTE SQL syntax. So you have this recursive source um, called counter, and all it's doing essentially is saying select one union with one or sorry, the counter plus one. So if you think about how you know a recursive uh, calculation would work, you know you, you keep calling um, down the stack until you get to the base case. In which case, uh, the counter uh, will, will want to return when the counter is more than ten. So it's going to keep calling the CTE and unioning the results um, until we get to ten, and then it'll stop and give us the answer back. So if we run it, we see kind of we can implement. Um, Kind of an arbitrary uh, 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 recursive or for loop function um, using SQL, which is, I, I will give it to Andy, it's pretty cool, but. Uh, yeah. 
Cool. Okay. So uh, just to conclude really quickly, uh, SQL is not a dead language. It's constantly evolving. The, the standard is still evolving. Um, things are, new things are being added all the time. Um, every uh, uh, system has its own weird uh, quirks or dialects. Um, so you have to be careful switching between them. And you should almost always strive to compute your answer as a single SQL statement. So when you write a SQL query, it's always best to try and get all of the uh, computation that you have done in, in one query. Because otherwise, um, you're going to end up going back and forth to the DBMS multiple times and can't optimize across all of them. So I, I, I will answer the question once I can just add the homework. Um, Homework was released. Uh, you just have to write some SQL queries. I think there are 10 queries. Uh, it's posted on the website, and it is due on Sunday, September 12th. And remember, there are no uh, no late days for homeworks. You you start losing points immediately. About the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. For a mic check, bust it. The bees are set to grab a 40. To put him the yoga, snap his neck. St. Ives, take a sip and wipe your lips. You, my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double.